Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of our Mindplex podcast. Today, I have the pleasure to welcome to the podcast Dr. David Bray, who wears currently several hats, among which distinguished fellow with the Atlantic Council, as well as with the Business Executives for National Security and with the Stimson Center, where he leads research working with the U.S. Navy and Marines and with the U.S. Special Operations Command. Uh, or maybe related to his work there. It's, uh, you know, his, uh, his accolades and, and uh, achievements are really uh, above my head and it would take the whole podcast to read them to you. So therefore, I'm going to interject and extract only those which I think is, are most relevant to our audience here. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say that David is a true prodigy. He began working with the U.S. government at age 15 on computer simulations at a high energy physics facility investigating quarks and neutrinos. No wonder that he was named one of the top 24 Americans who are changing the world under 40. And also, I would say under 20. <laughs> and, and also, he's a young global leader uh, with the World Economic Forum. And if I am to coin him, of course, I would call this prodigy a force of nature. He's a true maverick. Uh, David is the recipient of a plethora of awards and honors, among which the National Intelligence Exceptional Achievement Medal and the Joint Civilian Service Commendation Award. He is also a recipient of the Armed Forces Communications and Electronic Association's Outstanding Achievement Award for Civilian Government. And, and you know, having worked with the Department of Defense as a researcher myself, uh, I really, for Homeland Security, I've been working, I wasn't deploying in Afghanistan as David was, and I'm going to get there with one of my questions. Uh, but I can really appreciate the, the weight of such awards. I mean, really had significant contribution. If, if there's a big competition there, there's a lot of talent. As you can imagine, uh, in the Department of Defense, and to, to, to get these commendations and this award is really a lot. So congratulations, David. Uh, and welcome to the podcast. We're excited to have you. Well, thank you for having me. And I was uh, feeling myself blushing when you were saying that because uh, I'm, I'm human like everybody else. I, I put on my <laughs> pants like everybody else. And, you know, it's interesting what you mentioned about awards because there is a weight that comes with them. Uh, and I'll say just briefly, in some respects, as you mentioned, the art of being a positive change agent, the, the idea of trying to, to, to bring goodness to the world. It's a balance act between, you know, sometimes if you're getting an award, you're delivering exactly what people want, and sometimes you need to do that. And sometimes you need to actually say what they want is actually not what's needed. And so you're not going to get an award for it, but you still need to do it. And so it's a balance between, you know, sometimes I meet expectations and sometimes I step outside of expectations. Um, and, and it's really sort of, I would say for anybody, um, you know, recognize that awards, if anything, they give you the fuel to sometimes then be a leader later when somebody's asking you to do something and you think something else is needed in that circle. Yes, and, and they show that you have the competence to say those things later on. So this is, I think, you know, if you build on those awards and if as you are lucky, obviously, because you started early uh, as a prodigy, uh, then you can build on that reputation and show them the right way. <laughs> I <laughs> try. If My batting average is more than 50%. Them. <laughs> sometimes uh, there's some examples we can go into later where it takes more than 10 years before they circle back. But um, sometimes you speak truth to power and they listen. And sometimes you speak truth to power and you've got to wait a few years. And, you know, speaking of that, I'm really, because I've been now uh, uh, in Toronto, uh, like about two weeks ago at the self-organizing systems conference, which started 20 years ago or so as a community. And I was the, in that community 20 years ago. And, you know, then there was this AI winter. And then exactly as you say, I'm so happy that I'm alive to see it resurfacing and now. And we're going to talk about that as well. And I agree. Oh, yeah. You were ahead it of your time. time. You were definitely, I mean, <laughs> if you look at everything you were doing, self-organizing systems, you know, like you said, AI is not new. You were championing it several years ago, and, and I think the fact that it's come back shows, shows that you were ahead of your time and you were a vanguard. Exactly. And, and you as well, David, because you were a co-chair for AI on IEEE and uh, on an IEEE committee, and you also taught at Singularity University since 2017. And I don't know if you are aware that Dr. Ben Gertzel, who is the founder of the Singularity Net community, uh, and also is uh, our, our podcast is the podcast for that community. 
he actually is a co-founder of the Singularity University with Peter Diamandis, and he was also teaching there, and he's still teaching there, uh, seasonally, of course, like you. Right. And you also served as a visiting executive resident at Harvard University at MIT, but I'm going to get back to that a bit later. So your career path is definitely unusual, to say the least. Yeah, what, uh, what can, does your guy uh, do? What does yeah. he do? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so can you help us see a thread through it from neutrinos to AI? I mean, right. How do it's you thread this all together? Yes. And please, please, short, because I have so many other questions. No, no, but no, no, of no I will. <laughs> and, 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 and you can tell I'm blushing because, I mean, I always say, you know, you know, if you, if you set the bar high, then I've got to exceed the expectations and I will try. And so I will be brief that, you know, <laughs> I think it was really, I just give it all to my parents. My mom was a school teacher. Uh, my father was a Methodist minister. And so clearly they were both doing what they did out of a sense of service and mission and purpose. And um, everyone in my family were English majors. I was, I was good at writing and actually loved poetry. But they also said that if you wanted to get a scholarship, uh, if you wanted to go outside of state, outside of the state that I was born in, uh, to another college, I'd have to get a scholarship. And so I made the choice early on to focus on science. And, and I guess sort of being a preacher's kid, I always wondered, you know, this 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 world that my father was talking about in church, you know, could could one model it? Could one simulate it? Could one try to understand it through simulations? And so I uh, taught myself programming. And uh, the, the, like you mentioned, when I started working for the government very early, it was actually a model of the greenhouse effect and ozone layer deterioration back in the early 90s. That led to them saying, first, would you like to help with computer models of a electron beam facility? And then when I was 17, I got called down to the principal's office and there were four individuals in suits uh, who offered me a job wow. uh, that was going to be classified. It was going to involve small satellites. They said, you're not going to be able to tell your parents everything you're doing with these small satellites. I can say now some of it was, um, one, picking up crop growth from space as a way of trying to predict famines in advance. I was part of a team that did that. Wow. And then I got to lead a project on my own um, that was actually trying to see if we could actually pick up forest fires from space, scan the wind conditions and the foliation of the topography. Um, I couldn't fully declassify my Westinghouse Science Fair project, um, but that's what I did. Um, and Amazing. so trying to understand the world is what led me to where I, I sort of started this path. Amazing. And, you know, in 2019, you were invited. So from there, then you got to the world scene to give the Artificial Intelligence World Society Distinguished Lecture to the United Nations. And, you know, I would like you to tell us how is the United Nations regarding AI? What was the feeling of being on that stage? And uh, what was your vision? How was it received? I have so many questions. And, you know, did yeah, yeah, yeah. it trigger well, any significant change? Right. What was the impact of that? that what talk? was the impact so of this it? So it was on UN Charter Day, <laughs> uh, which is, for those not familiar, UN Charter Day was June the 26th. Um, and it was, uh, I believe it was 1945. So if you remember, we were still technically at war. World War II was still unfolding uh, when the UN was created. And so I sort of reflected on that moment as to what gave birth to the UN. And as we think about the fact that there's not just one revolution happening, one being AI, but we're also seeing revolutions that are happening with space technologies and biotechnologies. I mean, all the stuff you also focus on as well, they're happening simultaneously. The question when the UN was created was the question about, could you actually have a successful United Nations if nations themselves were not mature yet? And so if you remember the reconstruction after World War II and trying to build back the world, um, was actually trying to help nations internally be mature. And I would submit now, it's not just about countries being mature. The question is, are transnational companies mature as well? Because, you know, the UN is nations, it's not companies, but there's some companies that have some outsized influence, particularly when it comes to AI. And so my question is, as we move forward and we think about open societies and the values we have in open societies and that there's these multiple revolutions, bio, space, data, quantum, AI, and the like, how do we make sure that we continue to value the, the values of openness, uh, the freedoms that we celebrate, recognizing that, that governance is increasingly done by non-state actors? And, and so I was raising that, and it was sort of the idea that the best way forward is actually to lead by example, uh, especially because there is no textbook for this world. And so what I'm hoping is, is that we can convince a combination of companies, countries, and ideally communities, because at the end of the day, we need to focus on communities, to actually show the way forward by doing pilots in this area that actually show a message of, of that we can do this, we can sort this out. And it's not just about fear and, and, and you know, somehow that AI is going to take over the world, which it's not, at least not in the short term. 
But instead, how can we show messages of hope? Because I don't see a lot of hopeful narratives at the moment about 2030 or 2035 or beyond. Yes, no, that's fantastic. And it's so aligned with what we do here at Singularity Net because we are building that decentralized internet of artificial intelligence and as a knowledge graph that is actually enabling everyone's data to stay private and actually play the game different than how Google, Meta, X, which become political powers now based on all the information which they are, as you mentioned, yes, uh, processing however they want. And and uh, so this is your mission. I mean, the message which you sent to the United Nations is so aligned. And we have been this year uh, in Geneva at the ITU AI for Good Conference, in which our CEO and uh, founder, Dr. Ben Gertzel, sent a message absolutely resonant to what you sent back then in 2019. That was pre, let's call it pre-GPT explosion. So you were, of course, as always, <laughs> a visionary, but also Dr. Ben Gertz started Singularity Net uh, back uh, before that, you know, 2014, 15, 16, and we were already out there. You were also named senior fellow with the Institute for Human Machine Cognition, which is also a very big topic at Singularity Net because we are designing uh, humanoid robots, as you know, like Sophia robot, Desdemona robot, Grace, which uh, is a healthcare robot. Uh, and you also served as the executive director for the People Centered Internet Coalition, chaired by the, you know, legend that is Vin Surf. And I attended, as you invited me, and thank you so much, so grateful, several of the brainstorming events uh, that you organized uh, when you were championing that. And you coined the results in an article in 2019, and you recently updated that to adapt it to the recent uh, generative AI explosion. So tell us a bit, what are the three people-centered principles for artificial intelligence design? Yes, well, well thank you for that. And yes, um, I, 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 you mentioned several people that I think deserve recognition, if anything, more than I, which was you mentioned AI for good and Stephen Mbraki, uh, of course, has been championing AI for good. I want to give a shout out to him. You mentioned uh, also people-centered internet. And so both Vint Cerf and Mainlin Fung uh, it, it's been an honor to see the People Center Internet Coalition sort of advance and move forward. And you're right. Uh, I joined in 2017 as executive director. And, and at the time, it was thinking about uh, both what was happening on the Internet itself and the fact that it's not just about humans on the Internet. In fact, 2013, we humans became the minority online. Uh, there was more bot traffic online than there was humans. And that was 2013. And it's only gotten more challenging. Um, but also the concerns about disinformation and, and what was happening there. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't recognize that, unfortunately, you know, generative AI is going to be a double-edged sword. It's going to do amazing things and great things, and it's also going to challenge. Uh, and in fact, even before generative AI, um, one of the things I do want to sort of uh, recognize in the context of the People's Internet Coalition is that women who decided to run for government office, either to be politicians or, or nonpartisan civil servants, um, sometimes, so, and in fact, a lot of times, would will experience online bullying that includes bots, that includes sort of uh, automated scripts to sort of harass them. And with generative AI, we need to get ahead of this because the challenge is, is when those bots swarm them, um, it's hard for them to come out and say that's not true or that's not that's not real because that just gives more air to the lie or the myth that's out there. And so we need to think of new ways to sort of prevent uh, this online bullying because if, if, if half of our population cannot run for office or, or serve in government in a public capacity, that's a loss that affects us all. And so I want to call that um, but you're absolutely right that in that in 2019, uh, Ray Wong, uh, a fellow colleague who's with Constellation Connected Enterprise and Constellation Research, and I, we did an article with MIT Sloan in which at the time we were looking at deep learning systems. And we were concerned that deep learning was different than, say, expert systems or decision support systems because the outcomes are emergent. And I think that's very true with what we're seeing with, of course, large language models, which themselves are a subset of um, neural networks. And so if we look at the fact that these things are emergent, the question is, what can humans do to sort of get ahead of the curve? And I think one of it is just awareness that data poisoning is real. Uh, data poisoning is when basically either accidentally or intentionally information is brought into a machine that, that causes it to start doing behaviors that are not expected. And that's something that is a risk for anything that's a neural network. Uh, and that includes the, the, the GPTs that are out there at the moment. 
And so as we look at what we're going to be doing in the future, it's essential that we think about first and foremost data. And I'm not a big fan of what we did over the last 10 years when it came to data, where we thought that data was oil. I'm like, no, no, it's not oil. Oil, use it up and it's gone. Data, use it, it's still there. It's not something to be hoarded. It's not something to be you know, pulled from people without their sort of consent and awareness. If anything, the more the data is used by the very people that, it, that, that it's tied to, the community that it's tied to, the better the data gets. They improve it. And so I think we need to do data cooperatives. We need to involve people. The next step is actually sort of mindful monitoring. That again, you're going to have data that you trust, but there's going to be data that's on that sidelines of it's new data. Do you pull it in or not? And you almost have to have a naysayer pool that says, well, maybe this is either wrong data, it's inaccurate, it's not diverse enough, it's not representative of the questions we're asking, to be aware of that. And then finally, um, while you can't figure out all the second, third, and fourth order effects that will come out of a generative system, you can be clear about what are your obligations, what are your acknowledged sort of biases or blind spots that you might have in your organization relative to those obligations. What are your responsibilities to different stakeholders? And that's why I like the word stewardship and stakeholders as opposed to data owners. And then ultimately safeguards. I mean, and safeguards means you're going to be actively listening to these different stakeholders, the people that are involved in the communities, and involving them so that you have early warning if somehow the generative system is going in the wrong direction. And so ultimately, it's a very people-centered approach. It's not that top-heavy. Uh, however, it is a shift from the idea that data is to be hoarded and hidden as opposed to actually participating and involving the communities. Fascinating. And, you know, also, again, aligned with uh, our work, which, uh, you know, the, the NLMs and the, the neural networks are just a small box in the neural symbolic reasoning architecture, which Singularity Net is actually uh, working on, which is called Hyperon. Uh, for the artificial general intelligence. I don't want to go into details there, but it's very aligned because uh, the neural symbolic reasoning is enabling rules that can stop exactly are the, those stoppers which you mentioned and many other other things which are embedded in your principles. And I hope we can collaborate with you and maybe embed those principles. And I would like to extend an invitation right now to our, we call it BGI now. Beneficial for good, <laughs> it's the artificial intelligence for good. Uh, beneficial general intelligence, yes, the beneficial general intelligence conference that will be in Panama at the end of March, uh, and the end of uh, February, beginning of March next year. So uh, you will receive the invitation very soon. And I just want just one more thing regarding the bots which you mentioned. Uh, I call Facebook fake book. Because of that reason, I'm happy they changed the name and I hope they are going to go with uh, better identities and we, we are working on that as well, obviously, as you know, with decentralized identities, self-work, self-sovereign identities, and there are many technologies right now that can help in that regard. But I just want to move uh, to uh, a more recent encounter which I had with you related to AI and that was the Artificial Intelligence Workshop organized at George Mason University. Center for Advanced Human Machine uh, Studies, where you delivered uh, an amazing opening keynote. I was so impressed with it. It was on the promise and perils of artificial intelligence, which you uh, named at the time, and I, I have seen that also in the media, uh, alien intelligence, yes? Yes, So if it's you alien. can <laughs> share with us uh, some of your thoughts um, in this regard, uh, so what would be the pros and cons, uh, promise and perils maybe of artificial intelligence? And just to, to get you started, yes, so you started the keynote asking, do we have a trustworthy society? Aren't humans trustworthy? In a world when 90% of citizens think that government is incompetent, with trust in business having also reached its lowest low, why are we asking AI to be better? Than us, <laughs> so, so I thought well, it was really amazing how you started. Please go ahead. Well, thank you, and, I, and it goes back to yeah. I like to take the long view, and I and I, I think it's worth recognizing, like you said, we're, we're we're asking questions about trust in AI, but maybe that's actually a proxy for a larger question, which is trust in society. And, and and again, we've got multiple technological revolutions going on in parallel, and the question is, do we have the absorptive capacity? Uh, and it's worth noting that if you go back to the 1890s, the 1900s, the turn of the century, there was rapid industrialization, rapid technological progress, and surprise, 
rampant disinformation. Uh, Pulitzer and Hearst was associated with some fairly sensationalistic headlines that were less than factual. And in fact, we may in the United States have gone to war with Spain over a disinformation about whether or not the Maine was blown up intentionally versus accidental. Um, at the same time, uh, there was also very low trust across the aisle in our Congress. There was the same sort of political polarization that we see now. And so, you know, in some respects, human nature hasn't changed. And it may very well be that we're seeing a similar sort of rapid technological progress that's tied then to people feeling uncertain, they're feeling uncomfortable, which leads to an appetite for disinformation because it's easier to be angry or to be frustrated than it is to be fearful about the future. Um, and it may also cause the polarization that we see too. Or, and, and the question is, you know, what will bring us back together? Um, sadly, if you look at the 1890s and 1900s, we had to go through two world wars, the Great Depression and Spanish influenza. I would prefer to avoid that. Um, but what can we do to remind people that it's all of us, even if we do disagree on certain things, as opposed to us versus them and tribalism? So, so bring an AI, which is, I, I like to unpack that trust is defined as the willingness to be vulnerable to the actions of an actor you cannot control. Uh, and that can include individuals, that can include a group, that can include a community, or it can include a machine. And that trust includes perceived benevolence of the actor, perceived competence of the actor, and perceived integrity. And the challenge is if you look at large language models, um, benevolence is indeterminate. There's nothing that tells you whether you should trust it or not. Maybe it'll create a photo that will make you more or less trusting, but that's a generated photo that's not real. Um, the competence bit, well, the current version of large language models, and I'm not out to pick on them, but they don't distinguish between facts and fiction. They are, they are, they are predicted. Same thing for anything that does images and audio. They, they were just simply predictions based on the data they were given as a result of the prompt they received. And then lastly, integrity. If you tell a machine you think it's wrong, there's a chance that it might come back and say, you're absolutely right. You, I, I stand corrected and flip. And so integrity is not there either. And, 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 and again, I don't want to pick on large language models because in some respects, these same problems are present in companies, in governments, in community associations. Um, you know, if anything, we have a problem of how do we truly better perceive benevolence, competence, and integrity when online, as you mentioned, and, and I don't want to just pick on, on, on the large tech companies, but it's very easy to create manufactured perceptions, true or imagined. I mean, I experienced this myself in 2017 when there was a high profile proceeding at the Federal Communications Commission. And I had asked at the time for general counsel if I could actually use capture the tech bots. And they said, well, no, if technically someone's both has challenges with hearing and, and seeing, you, CAPTCHA may not work. And so we're going to have to not use CAPTCHA. I said, can I block obvious spam, spam defined as someone's filing a comment 100 times a minute? And they said, no, because one of those 100 comments a minute might actually be real. So 23 million comments later, um, <laughs> which was, you know, it was a flood. We actually had to spin up. I, I celebrate the IT team, kept the servers up 99.4% of the time. We spun up 30 times the amount of capacity we normally did. because That was the only thing we could do was just drink from the fire hose. Um, and, and the things that people uploaded. I mean, in 2014, people were uploading War and Peace in their washer and dryer manual and their math homework. I mean, it was it was just a flood, and we had to take it all. But after 23 million comments, after I had sort of talked about this with Ben Surf, I was even asked by the chairman office, is this a denial of service? And I said, at the application layer, yes. At the network layer, no, nothing's wrong at the network layer. And and also nothing's been breached. But at the application layer, it's effectively a denial of service. And Ben Surf, who, as you know, knows something about the internet, agreed. Um, it was a New York Attorney General in 2021 that concluded that 18 million of the 23 million comments were from less than authentic sources, 9 million from one side of the aisle, and 9 million from the other side of the aisle. And so that was domestic. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> if that was 2017, we have to wonder what 2024 has in store. And that's why I think it's essential we figure out not just trust in AI, but if we don't have trust in society, um, we've got some bumpy roads up ahead. You will be very busy. Twenty twenty four coming. I can see uh, that. I'd like I'm... to do something before things go wrong, as opposed to the other way around. I try to put out the fires, as opposed to be in the middle of them. But I understand now. Also, you know, really the weight of your words. I just want to say, coming uh, back to trust and to the values. Yes, um, you also mentioned uh, in your keynote that at the global scale, this is a values competition rather than an arms race with AI. And indeed, yes, so that is exactly what you were talking about here. And I have to say that when I uh, did, when I was uh, holding the Canada Research Chair in eSociety, 
I actually yes, uh, was involved in the Privacy, Security and Trust Research Network. And uh, I define trust very similar to how you say, but much simpler. Trust is a choice. And indeed, it's a choice to expose your vulnerability, but also, yes, to 100%. be ready. You want to be vulnerable or not, exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, but also, it ties in with resilience, yes, because otherwise you cannot, I mean, you really risk a lot. And, uh, and I can see a lot of resilience in you as well, that you displayed all this willpower to actually stand all those naysayers and then, you know, uh, still, uh, <laughs> uh, even if later, yes, it was not too late. Yes, but at least it was not about only... three and a half years later. You just had to bite your tongue and wait your time. So, yes, yeah, I know, but you know. You could tell them now, I told you so, and maybe hopefully no. they will. <laughs> no, 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 no. That never worked. Fortunately, it, it, and it's one of the things that actually, and, and I realized, again, it, this was the only thing I had to give for my country. I willingly give it. I didn't have to lose an arm. I didn't have to lose a limb. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of injustice in the world, and, and mine was a very small one where I was I yeah. was something, you know, there were, there were political figures that said he made it up, which was not true, and... I didn't have a political party, so I couldn't say anything. But that was a minor injustice compared to the daily injustices that happened. And so I think if anything, it's about trying to help people understand with compassion that when they suddenly see something online that makes them tremendously angry or gets your emotions up, you know, pause and say, is, is there someone that's someone or some algorithm that's trying to hijack my emotions? Um, and, and, and then also, you know, I had a very formative moment where I actually had built a computer simulation in 1998 of the spread of HIV AIDS in South Africa. And so I was in South Africa and, and that was a country of tremendous beauty and also tremendous pain, obviously what happened with apartheid. And so, you know, I try to remind people, everyone's fighting a battle that you don't know about. I mean, it's a, it's not a quote I can attribute to me. I mean, other people have said it, but just, just try to understand the world that, that it's never as simple as we make it out to be. And if we can be a little bit more compassionate, then maybe we can also begin to fix some of these much larger injustices in the world. Yes, and we are so aligned with that because, of course, that implies us or even ourselves to become better human beings overall. And this is what Ben Gertzel and our artificial general intelligence community, which is working towards the singularity, is actually also uh, realizing. And one important thing there, one important ingredient there is transcendence, right? So transcend our human limitations and actually elevate our behaviors. And transhumanism is also dealing with that. So uh, that is another conversation. I can delve so much into that. Oh, and... I love that you went to transcendentalism. One, I'm, I mean, I love, <laughs> I love the transcendental and movement. Your father, your father, right, being in, yeah, yeah. Uh, in that the realm. realm. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> yes. the reason why the transcendental movement died out is they said, don't follow me. They said, do your own thing, which, of course, is hard to create a movement. But, yes. you know, what it points to is, you know, I'll, I'll be candid. I mean, one of the challenges I have, especially in trying to figure out the world that we're in now, because there's so many things happening. I mean, obviously, there were very tragic events that happened in the Middle East recently. There's challenges happening in Europe, Asia, you know, around the world. There's challenges here at home. You know, it's always about recognizing that there's a fog of things that you know and don't know or things that you believe. And so I, I often, you know, it's interesting. My wife says, you know, she says, you reflect a lot. And I'm like, I have to reflect a lot because I need to understand if I'm seeing the world uh, for what I think it is accurately or if I'm somehow missing something. And I think that's essential. And maybe that's where AI can begin to hold up a help, a help for us is can it be that sort of opportunity for us to reflect on how we can make better decisions individually and collectively? I think one of the things I like to tell people is maybe the Turing test is a wrong test because the Turing test was a machine trying to fool a human into thinking it was human, which means it was naturally trying to deceive. What if instead we, we actually say, how can we make humans individually and collectively better at making decisions? And so you could actually almost have the baseline for how's your current decision-making processes? How well are they tied to some either market performance or reality performance or whatever? And if you include AI with the humans, how does that uplift the decision making to either be more representative, more diverse in its nature, more exploratory of possible creativity? Because we know, for example, in medical situations, large language models, while they have their flaws and they will hallucinate, they are actually very good at least raising for the doctor or the nurse practitioner or whoever to consider 
edge cases that are not familiar to the doctor, the things that are the zebras, the rare cases. And so I'd like to say, instead of a Turing test, which is can the machine fool you into thinking it's human, if you recognize that it's alien, how it thinks and how it computes, then what we really need to have instead is how can the machine collectively make human decision making? Yes, and in this regard, it's also mentioned in your keynote that um, artificial intelligence can help us build attitudes, institutions, and social structures that are benevolent. And so you gave some examples uh, now on how we can actually employ that uh, in test cases and so on and so forth. So I hope we will be also working together, speaking I'd of also our, our conference and so on, because I need I test cases. my thing. I like to do experiments, right. so, I mean, with, <laughs> with people. I mean, it's involving them, participating with them. The messiness of that is what I love. This is Thank this. you so much. And, you know, along this line of thought, although I have a lot to say there also with regard to your thinking fast and slow, Kahneman's uh, uh, book as well, uh, and uh, many other, of course, uh, uh, scientific works that uh, actually underline all what you mentioned. But as a question, do you think we will manage to deploy this beneficial for humanity, artificial intelligence, which is, you know, our mission at Singularity Net? I mean, you can keep the answer for your talk at our conference, or <laughs> and if yes, of course, how, but that is also, everybody is thinking about that. So <laughs> it's, it does seem like there's a lot of storm clouds on the horizon, obviously. I mean, you look at the tragic news that happened just recently in the Middle East, and as I mentioned, and what's already been happening in, in Europe and Asia. Um, if we can get the data part right, because I feel like we, we've jumped to AI and we've not figured out better models of how open societies can involve people as data participants, data stewards, data stakeholders. If we can get the data part right, then yes, I mean, there will be cases. And in fact, I'll, I'll give a shout out to an effort that if anyone's interested, um, there's an effort called Zero to Three in the United States, which is to make sure any infant between ages of obviously birth to three years of old can receive the physical, mental, and emotional care they need. And that's yes. support for the caregivers, might be a single parent, might be a parent that's working two jobs a, a week, you know, under a lot of stress. And historically, they've had to fill out forms, they've had to show up at places and and this is trying to say, can we use basic text messages? So SMS texting that you can do even on a flip phone, where you can say, I need help getting either the following resources for my child's physical health or, or neurological health or whatever it might be. And you're interacting, in this case, with a machine that is smart enough to connect you both to the resources, but also make sure they don't send everybody to the same clinic or at the same hospital. And instead of filling out a form, you're doing questions. Now, obviously, there's a lot of that needs to be unpacked there in terms of you know, what does what does literacy look like when you're texting back and forth? How do you make sure they actually are involved in the process and they're trusting of the process? And one of the things we're hoping to do from the very beginning, and we're just getting started, but if people want to help, is involve those that are receiving the care as part of the oversight board for the data. And similarly, involve the nurses and the doctors that would be providing the care as part of it too. And so this is a new model that I think will show the power of if we can make sure that every infant, in, in starting with the United States and obviously roll it out overseas, gets the physical, mental, and emotional care they get, just think about the impacts 18, 20 years Absolutely, later. Absolutely. Because, you know, actually, we live in, we are a traumatic, <laughs> traumatized uh, world. Yes. Yeah? So every human being, I mean, very few. And of course, uh, we live here in the best country in the world. Let's acknowledge that. Think about the whole world, right? I mean, most of the population on this planet has been traumatized. And therefore, what you say, this zero to three, yes, it's so important and so important to be rolled out quickly. And that's why uh, also we adopted in how we develop uh, artificial general intelligence. So we start exactly with that. So we are at toddler level intelligence right now. You know, and we show them how to teach them, how to actually how to learn and, and we try to teach them and so on and so forth. So so I'd like to to work with you as well on that and maybe we can find together ways uh, to uh, raise healthy humans and then learn from there on how to learn to, to, to raise healthy artificial intelligences. Because here is another question and uh, you started your keynote exactly with that. I mean, no matter how much we want to blame them, artificial intelligences will only be able to reflect our human nature. And uh, 
we have to take the opportunity to look in the mirror at ourselves. And this is exactly what you're saying and identify which are our limitations. But my hope and our hope here, you know, we are like uh, avant-garde uh, researchers at SingularityNet is that this will in fact not be the case. That we are in fact creating a new species, if I may, which will transcend our evolutionary limitations and will help us actually also like an attractor to transcend our limitations by showing us how to be, being the ones which you are talking about, the compassionate and so on and so forth. What's your take on this? I know you are much more oh, it's out there. Uh, but I, I, Yeah, so <laughs> here's what I would say. I mean, as someone who did biology and computer science as an undergrad, I was fascinated. You know, people are like, this was back in the 90s, where people were like, well, how does biology relate to computer science? I'm like, well, if anything, computers are the systems we build and we design. Biology, we are products of, you know, evolution, natural selection pressures, our environment. Um, and, and it's worth recognizing that a lot of the traits that, that humans present um, were, were great for certain environments. Um, but we've created, in some respects, a very artificial environment that is foreign from the experiences that we're having now. I mean, you know, for most of our history as a species, you, you didn't run into more than 80 people beyond your immediate family members. And, 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 you know, now, I mean, how many people online run that more than 80 people online may not even see them on a daily basis, let alone in person. And so, uh, you know, there, there's going to be cases where, you know, the reality is, I hate to say it, you know, humans without education and without experiences and without a broad base, sadly, can default to being xenophobic. Um, but through education, through experiences that can be overcome and we can actually sort of change our mindset. Uh, the reality is anybody you meet will be will carry different biases, biases to what they like, what they don't like. Uh, there's also confirmation bias, on cost bias, and, and you can't get rid of those biases. But if I but may say, be... those zero to three years are essential in actually oh, yeah. that education, early education is critical. Then you can be raised yes. or grow up. With less biases, let's put it this way, maybe not zero. Less biases, but also <laughs> even, 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 and it's been shown like abstract thinking, the window for learning abstract thinking, it's not like you can't do it, but it's a lot harder if you don't do it before 18 or 19 years of age. And so uh -huh. can we expose you to more abstract thinking? Can we have that formative experience where maybe at 14 or 15, you do spend a month in a place that is different from how you grew up around people that are different than when you grew up? And you realize at the end of the day, we're all human. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough um, Right after I did that experience in South Africa, I came back and I, I told my, my mentor in college, I said, I feel like I'm stuck in a tower. I'd like to do another year outside doing stuff. And he said, okay, but remember, you always make more of a difference as an insider than an outsider. And at the time, I didn't fully appreciate what he meant. Uh, I ended up both working for Microsoft and Yahoo in the 90s, but also what I do is I would work for about like six weeks and then I'd go overseas with Habitat for Humanity. So I went to the hall. Ghana, Romania, Honduras, and, and serves as a crew leader uh, with Habitat for Humanity. And, and, and some of the places that opened me with, you know, Nepal was a case where here they relatively, you know, they, they gave us crackers and Coke, which was probably equal to about a month and a half of their salary to complete strangers, you know, and how many of us would welcome complete strangers into our house and, and give them the equivalent of a month and a half of our salary. And so it seems like some cases, the more we have, the less sharing we are. But I raise that because those experiences, you know, I, I, I'd like it for everybody to have those opportunities. And maybe it's a combination of both in-person, you know, can we do virtual pen pals now? Can AI help translate language? I mean, it's sad, but there actually was an effort yes, a long while can, ago actually. with pen pals between Palestine and Israel, but maybe we need to start that up again. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's recognizing that the brain is a wonderful thing. And it's got some flaws. That's all I can say. And it's not like we can get rid of them, but we can become more mindful and awareness of them. And so can the AI, you know, I don't, the last thing I want is eugenics, but can the AI help us be more aware of our limitations, but then also help amplify, like maybe, maybe you and I are great at creative things, but someone else on the team is really good at making sure we keep on task and we get things done. So collectively, the three of us or four of us could be better together. And so what I want to see is, what does human machine teaming look like at teams levels, at organization levels? And and some people say, well, I'll never take orders from a machine. I'm like, how many of us follow our GPS? You know, I mean, we're already taking orders from a machine. And so could the machine over time learn your strengths, 
learn your weaknesses, maybe deliver courses that help overcome some of your weaknesses and amplify your strengths, but then also pair you with teammates that can collectively make you better together. That's fantastic. And really, I call that collective flourishing. And you say human machine. And uh, yeah, so this is uh, a big part of uh, of our work at Singularity Net. But I just want to, you know, because you mentioned all these uh, laws and, and uh, what's going on in the world and your experience around the world, um, you also work as IT chief for the bioterrorist preparedness and response program at the U.S. And uh, that was uh, for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You led uh, a few programs there. You led the uh, program's technology response to 9-11, to Andrax, and other international public health emergencies. So what do you think in that regard? Can AI help in preventing bioterrorism? Yeah, well, and I'm glad you brought that up because I'm obviously reflecting a lot now that terrorism seems to unfortunately be back in the news. Uh, exactly. It's, it's That's why I have, I have brought yes. the question. <laughs> so. Yep. And, 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 and I will say, having done that work, um, you know, you have to reflect like, one, what kind of world even requires folks to do like counter bioterrorism work? You know, because I mean, bioterrorism is horrific. I mean, it's, 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 it's not necessarily a way to kill lots of people, but it creates a lot of fear and panic because people can't see it. Um, and so part of what countering bioterrorism is about is, is actually, one, trying to make sure it doesn't happen, but then, two, also addressing the fear factor, the, the, the panic factor. And, and, and I think uh, I would say on, on the realist front, I tell people the good news is, is we're increasingly democratizing technology. The bad news is, is we're increasingly democratizing technology. And so the capabilities are increasingly getting easy for people to unfortunately do things that were only possible by large nation states in the bioterrorism realm a while back. And then that's not a good thing. I mean, that, that's where we're going. Uh, and, and, you know, at the same time, I celebrate that we're about 8 million people, but according to the, either the NIH or National Health Services in the UK, between 1% to 2% of people are psychopaths. And so that's that's a challenge. Yes, Not that trauma. all do criminal behaviors. Yeah. They just won't feel the same emotional response to hurting another human being. So I think what we're going to need to do as we evolve for this next stage is is it's already happening that we're instrumenting the planet through different means, through Internet of Things, through space technologies, even biosensors and biomarkers. Um, first, we need to make sure we do so in a way that's preserving of privacy. Um, and in fact, one of the things we were very conscientious about in the bioterrorism program was it was collective patterns of life, not any one specific person, because uh, we wanted to maintain truth and, and, and consistency with the Constitution. The second thing is, though, we did get early warnings, for example, um, uh, this was actually for the original coronavirus, which later became known as SARS, severe respiratory syndrome. The price of garlic went up tenfold in certain parts of Southeast Asia. And also, uh, we saw increased reflectivity of cars and parking lots around hospitals. Uh, and that was collective reflectivity. And so that was early indicators that, sure enough, played themselves out with COVID as well. The only difference is that's now available as a commercial means in terms of pricing data, as well as commercial satellites. And so... Imagine that we build the equivalent of smoke detectors for biomarkers and other things that aren't tracking specific people and it's still preserving of privacy, but they say something odd has happened in the environment. It could be natural. It could be human caused. It could even be climate change related. But we've got to sort of use the instrumentation of the planet to increasingly have early warning networks that don't require one government to talk to another government because for various reasons, governments may be delayed because they're either embarrassed, they see it as a national security risk or whatever communicate. But if instead we have those alerts go off, much like we have real world smoke detectors now for fire, that can allow faster response and hopefully save lives. Fantastic. It would be so amazing to have had a smoke detector for COVID, you know, and as one who worked closely with the CDC, and I know that the government doesn't always listen to you, as you shared. <laughs> like I said, my betting average is about a little bit more than 50%, but exactly. it's not 100%. No. <laughs> so, but as one who worked closely with the CDC on on drugs, on stars, can you share a bit from your experience and, you know, to give us some insight on the actual response to COVID-19, because the smoke detector was not used. As far as <laughs> right, we recommending know. I was not in government at the time. Um, at the time, I was with the Atlantic Council. I'm now with the Simpson Center, but I, I joined the Atlantic Council in 2020, and literally, we were launching the Geotech Commission, the commission focused on the geopolitical impacts of new technologies and data 
on February 11th, 2020, which is the same day that COVID wow. was declared a pandemic. Yes. Um, and, and, and despite everything that happened in 2020 and 2021, which was interesting times, we actually did get bipartisan consensus uh, from both the Senate and the House for our recommendations involving cyberspace, bio, and the like. And it was the report was hand-delivered to the president in May of 2021, as well as to the House. Um, but um, what I would say is responding to a pandemic, uh, responding to bioterrorism, what you're really trying to do is get ahead of the curve as quickly as possible. Um, because the longer you wait, things are not just linear in terms of the impact. They can quickly become exponential. And, and so, you know, going forward, sadly, there will be another pandemic. I mean, that's just, again, good news is there's 8 billion people on the planet. Bad news is there's 8 billion people on the planet. And yes. then, <laughs> you know, nature is doing its thing and things will naturally occur even if humans don't, don't create it themselves. And so... Um, what I would probably recommend, and I've actually had some conversations with some places, is thinking about how can we do a way that's consistent with U.S. values of, of, of freedom and openness, but at the same time, you know, if, if you monitor aggregate over-the-counter drug sales or aggregate school absenteeism or aggregate um, 911 calls, those can be warning mechanisms that don't identify any one specific person, that don't violate privacy or civil liberty protections but can actually be protections. And that's actually what we used to do in the bioterrorism program was uh, we had folks that before either the president or the vice president would speak, they'd go about three to five days in advance and sort of begin the, the custom code, because it was custom code at the time, to monitor these feeds for the general patterns of, of aggregate behavior. And sure enough, after one event, we did see a massive spike in gastrointestinal medications being sold over the counter. But that actually happened to be just because what they ate at the sporting event. But I read that because... You know, what we almost need is a science of how patterns of life can help make our planet more responsive and adaptive, be it for natural pandemics, for terrorism, or for climate-related emergencies. Absolutely, and artificial intelligence can help here. And because you mentioned your work uh, with uh, the government, the president, the White House, um, I just wanted to uh, underline that recently you are part of a National Academy of Public Administration standing panel on technology leadership that did a call to action on responsibly using AI to benefit public service at all levels. And this is a part of the U.S. government effort spearheaded uh, in uh, May 2023, and we are very well aware of them. Uh, by the executive office of the president of the United States, yes, which she announced actions to promote responsible artificial intelligence innovation, uh, having previously announced in October 2022 a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. So, uh, being as having been involved uh, in this, I wanted to ask you if you can tell us a bit about this effort, if they are effective, if they are enough, if they are too much maybe hindering progress and innovation. What is your take? And um, if you can tell us a bit about the Bill of Rights, what does it stipulate? What does the Responsible AI Act entail? Sure. So for the National Academy of Public Administrations, it, it, it's an honor to be with them. They're probably one of the last few bastions of true nonpartisan uh, leadership. I'm happy that they have you. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> so... <humble. laughs> Well, I mean, they're a great group of people. They're they're, they're former governors, uh, former mayors, state legislators, members of Congress, nonpartisan um, senior executives like myself. And, 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 and so what we're trying to do there is, is sift through some of the hype and the fear, because there's a lot that, as you know, I mean, unfortunately, um, there's a lot of hype and fear in, in, in the disguise of marketing for whatever purpose that's out there. And, and really trying to figure out what, what are the sort of measured approaches that public service can move forward, because there is a lot of questions. Um, the AI Bill of Rights, as you mentioned, that was actually written by, uh, that came out of the Office of Science Technology Policy about a year ago. Um, it's interesting because it, it's trying to extend what was done in the 1970s when it comes to the Privacy Act. It's recognizing that the Privacy Act came out when there were these things that were called advanced data processing systems, which, which we later refer to as IT systems, ran the risk that through correlation of your financial and other data, they might you know, expose your privacy. And so they're good high-level principles. I do think, so So there's, you may have seen, there's now efforts to try and do a label um, in which people can look at the label and figure out for themselves, much like a food label, do they buy this product or not? The challenge I think you have is this space is moving so fast. You know, it's not steady state. Um, and so what, what a machine can do today 
it's probably going to do something much different later if it gets pushed an update. And then the question about even updates. I mean, we look at what happened with Solar Winds, which was not AI at all related, but Solar Winds was a product that was doing exactly what it was supposed to do until one of the updates got corrupted through an advanced persistent threat. Um, and so, yeah, this is, I mean, I worry that the the speed at which this place is changing is going to make it very hard to 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 do governance by traditional ways that we did in the 20th century. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try. I agree. And if I can just uh, interject here, because this is, of course, very much in our mind, it was always uh, beneficial to have intelligence conference and so on and so forth. So, you know, Steven Wolfram, who is uh, definitely one of the, maybe the smartest person on the planet at the moment. So he, uh, in, a, in a recent uh, take, uh, he said that Yes, okay, uh, he doesn't believe that we can guide artificial intelligence towards good, and which was pretty worrisome for us. And he actually said, why? So we cannot put those stoppers. If we not put those stoppers and put the artificial intelligence in a box, he said then, we would actually make it very boring. So we would ex eliminate all the creativity because you need a new data and you need dynamic systems in order to stimulate creativity. And therefore, it, as you mentioned now, it's not so easy and straightforward to guide it towards good or to guarantee it's going to perform for the benefit of humanity. I just wanted to, to interject yeah, there. Yeah, no, so I would that, say, yes. here's what I would say as, as a challenge for Stephen. <laughs> just to put it <laughs> then you will both be at the conference, so well, and be prepared. Get your boxing ask... gloves. <laughs> no, I'm not boxing, but I would just say as a friendly question, has he ever raised a child? Because in some respect, when we as parents raise a child, you hope the best for them. You hope to expose them to great things. He has a, he has no a son, which I met, by person. the way. Yes, he has a son, which I met, and very smart, also a genius, and he, they work together. Yeah, so I guess <laughs> so, I would say is, 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 is clearly he was bold enough to be willing to raise a child and let it off into the world. And, and I don't think he would say that, you know, he, he you know, I mean, I, I'm sure every, par every parent worries for their child. When you, you know, I have, I'm, a, I'm a father, but. I think, you know, we can we can we can expose these machines through the data and the other cues we give them to things that make them more likely to go in the direction of benevolence. And then, but you also think about what do we do for humans? I mean, the reality is humans do great things, mundane things, and awful things. We have mechanisms in place in depth to one incentivize them to ideally go more towards goodness and and less towards badness. We have, you know, medical review panels. And so when something goes wrong in a medical setting, other doctors get together and they actually review. Did the doctor do the right thing and it was just a bad circumstance? Did the doctor do malpractice? Was it act you know, was there something worse here? And so I think there are mechanisms and, and one thing I like to tell people is replace the word AI with organization. Because a lot of these things that we are ascribing to AI saying, I'm not sure we can ever get it to be benevolent or not. The same is true for organization. <laughs> and, Completely agreed. And especially coming from that, you know, e-society, self-organizing systems and self-organization. Nobody's saying work, let's get rid of all the organizations. They're also exactly. not saying completely laissez-faire. I mean, most people aren't. Some people are. You know, but I'm also saying, you know, it's, it's, I like to remind people that with scuba diving, that regulator is important else you die, but you don't want too much regulation or else you also die. And so it's that balance, and I and I think it's useful as we think about this that yes, AI in some respects may introduce some interesting novelties in terms of speed, scope, and and and, and scale. But organizations have been doing this for a long time, and we've had to help adjust and correct the self-organizing system for organizations. We can do this with AI. Too. And you are invited with Stephen Wolfram on a panel on the topic. All right, <laughs> Just I look forward to it, and we can we can compare made. our notes on fair day. Yeah. <laughs> I will send you his podcast as well. And sure, I will send you. him our podcast. Sure. So just as a warm up. <laughs> we can compare notes and maybe hey, we can even a warm up back together. It's so. going to be cool. Yes. And you know, uh, just if I may, uh, because your achievements are so outstanding. And of course, for me, I mean, the people who are in Afghanistan are all heroes and mine as well. You volunteered in 2009 to deploy to Afghanistan. Wow, that was a long time ago. Uh, I thought, you know, I mean, you must have been very young, right? So, and and but you volunteered to, to to go there. Speaking of organizations, to help them think differently 
on military and humanitarian issues. That's very interesting, right? In the context of what we're talking about, of organizations, AI, and so on and so forth, think differently. So did you succeed to help them think differently? What did you have in mind to go there to help them think differently? Like, tell yeah, me a so, bit. So, so well, first and foremost, I, I want to give a salute to all who have served, um, whether it's in Afghanistan, yes. Iraq, elsewhere. Um, that's, that's essential. And, and I was traveling essentially with what was called the Institute for Defense Analyses underneath SECDEF travel orders. And if you remember, um, when the administrations changed, they kept uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Robert Gates uh, as SECDEF. And so um, a call went out to the Institute for Defense Analyses for a nonpartisan to go downrange uh, to Afghanistan. And I had actually literally just moved up to D.C., having done my Ph.D. and my postdocs. And my Ph.D. and postdocs were on how do you... How do you involve humans and machines to make better decisions, better knowledge? And if I exchange. may, David, just for our audience, the postdocs yeah. were at MIT and Harvard, just so they know, because, you know, we have All an right, audience of scientists. Drop, I appreciate it. Yes, it was fun. Okay. And, 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 uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and MIT was with uh, Tom Malone in the Center for Collective Intelligence, and Harvard Amazing. was with Jerry Meckling, a Leadership for Network Worlds. And Amazing. So, because, because our community is a community of scientists, of course, and oh, they yeah. can appreciate this. Thank yeah, you. It, well, and it was, and so if anything, I thought Afghanistan was an interesting, you know, one to be a nonpartisan downrange. Basically, I got to grow a beard, didn't have to wear a uniform, got to go outside the wire and talk to anybody. Wow. Wow. Um, and, and I jokingly said I was a human flak jacket if anything ever went bad. But um, so, so, respect, so, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would, my wife just said, make sure you come back. I was like, I'll try. Um, but, you know, Afghanistan, I was fortunate enough to, to, to be able to ask questions that needed to be asked. And so I did have success in some places. Like one, one issue back in 2009 was as I listened to people, because my, my theory of the case is you, you listen to people, you observe, you, you ask them questions, Socratic questions. And, and it was clear it was taking more than a week for things to go from our, our systems to our NATO or our coalition partner systems, which, you know, a, a, a week in a, in a battlefield context is almost like an eternity. And so that led to things like A-Space and other things that you may have seen in the news that tried to actually fix this problem of, of knowledge exchanging. So I succeeded there. Um, there was some other things, though, that, that I had mixed results. Uh, like I, I asked, like, why were we, we, we were trying to do the traditional DOD thing. When, whenever anything went bad, we'd say, we're looking into it, we're investigating. And then we'd share our results about three or four weeks later. But the trouble is, I think um, adversaries had figured out how to use our, our, our very OODA loop, our Orient Observe, Decide, Act loop against us, where they would manufacture events that looked bad. Um, and so while we are saying, honestly, that we're investigating it, that, that innuendo that things already look bad would paint us in a bad light. And even when we came out three or four weeks later, the news cycle news bubble had moved on. And so even then in 2009, it was interesting. There were problems of disinformation in Afghanistan. And sadly, 10 years later, the U.S. became more like Afghanistan, uh, including being tribal. Um, the last thing that I actually, and I today have my slides, um, both unclassified, I also gave some classified ones, which obviously I don't have, but the unclassified ones I do have. Um, so after about 45 days, I, I, I gave a briefing um, and I ended up being there for about 120 days, but 45 days and I said, the challenge is, is literacy is only 20% and that's if you're a male. And, and so if we think we're going to you know, do nation state building, we're going to somehow bring democracy to Afghanistan. We've got a huge education and literacy problem, and it's not even one country. It's searching different tribes. I'm not sure that's going to work here, but I don't want to just observe the problem. You know, you never bring problems to the general without solutions. So I gave two things in 2009, which was one, either A, pull uniform troops out and have special forces offer aid to the 13 different tribes, and the aid would be contingent upon them promising not to abide a tribe that means harm to us, or B... Um, invite either India, because India is a lot more like Pashtun culture, um, or invite China that does share a border through the UN, the United Nations, to play a peacekeeping role with us there too. Um, and at the time, for various reasons, that that, that was buried. And, and part of my job sometimes is I, I raise my suggestions and salute the flag if it gets buried. But of course, you know what actually eventually played out. And I, so I just wonder if we had played it differently, uh, if we would have done a different strategy. What I do think, though, is as we look to this new world, it's getting a lot easier for non-state actors to play the role of insurgent. And the question is, how does that impact peacekeeping operations, humanitarian operations? And similarly, how do you make sure those very humanitarian operations don't themselves become a target? Uh, and I think that's going to be something we're going to have to figure out for obviously what's going on now 
and, and in the future ahead. Yeah, and tying in with the organization and self-organization, in my work with the Department of Defense, I uh, actually tackled exactly this. It's called the self-organizing security network, deploying the self-organizing security network. And I share um, your, I mean, I don't know if it's frustrations or whatever, because that work was also buried, but, but I wanted to say that I shared, uh, I mean, of course, I work very closely with the Department of Defense and uh, also with NASA Ames uh, Emergency Response, Bob Dolce, who is a hero, was a hero of 9-11. Thank you. Yes, exactly. And also, so he also worked with Katrina and he shared his journal in which he said the same, what you shared now, that he told them, you know, he tried to make them think differently, but, you know, it didn't take flight. And he was there just by thinking in his journal and afterwards, you know, it's like, oh, why didn't they do this? So, yes, yep. uh, it, it, there's a lot to say there. But I just want to, to underline something here, David. Your passion includes, like mine, of course, but your passion includes complicated, near impossible missions involving humans and technology in challenging circumstances. There is no doubt about that. And you have an amazing skill at transformational leadership uh, in change of verse settings, which is exactly this like self-organizing security network. Uh, you got the Global CIO 100 award twice for this work and for your skills. Usually this is awarded to private sector Fortune 500 companies, but they had to give it to you for your skill and for your contribution. So I want to really congratulate you for that. And um, also to underline and maybe uh, ask a question as well here that you provide strategic advice to many organizations confronting turbulent environments on multiple topics, ranging from quantum computing, uh, coming back to those neutrinos, <laughs> passion of yours, uh, to commercial space endeavors, synthetic biology, to data cooperative, paired with AI change strategies for adaptation. And adaptation and adaptive systems, of course, it's also a very big passion of mine. This is of very high interest also to SingularityNet, of course, whose mission is to deploy the beneficial artificial general intelligence by building this global brain with knowledge graphs and adaptation. And uh, you recently published um, an article on strategies of adaptation in a changing world. And I think this is so important, especially with what is happening right now in the world, which you underlined, yes, and we can see in the news. So. Can you share with us from your experience, what are the best strategies for adaptation? What uh, to do to best adapt to a changing world? What not to do to stay on course? And then it changes so yeah. hard. We I'll, I'll do what not to do first. And then but first <laughs> I'll say, um, you know, again, thank you for that very humbling um, accolade. I mean, it, it, it really does go to the team of teams. Um, so at the Federal Communications Commission, when I started in 2013, there had been several CIOs and acting CIOs. I think some count of like nine CIOs or acting CIOs in eight years, which is always a great sign for CIO number 10 that things are just going great. Um, and the good news is I, I, I survived and lasted four years. Um, but, but part of it was just a recognition that they had to sort of change what they were doing um, because they were spending more than 85% of their budget just to maintain legacy systems, um, more than 207 systems, average age more than 10 years old. And so we ended up moving in, in less than two and a half years, everything to either public cloud or private hosting. And we did that pretty much with the existing team we have. And part of that is, is I realized I had to sort of, so one tip that you should do as you're trying to lead change is to make sure it's not just your change initiative. You've got to shift people from being problem holders and admirers to being problem solvers themselves. And so one of the things I was very intentional about was um, Socratic question. And just saying, like, how are things going? How are we? And the first time I did this, um, I think uh, only less than 10% were excited about the future. 50% uh, uh, were undecided and probably wondering if I'm still going to be there in three months or not. Uh, and the remainder actually wanted some things to possibly go back to 1990. Couldn't. Um, but at the very end, someone raised a hand and said, I have a beef. And again, I was only able to ask questions. So I said, could you please tell me more? And then he said, it happened 17 years ago. When we started about two weeks ago, and I was like, could you tell me more? And he, he told about a circumstance where there was a misunderstanding between the government and the contract. And so I said, at, after he'd shared that story, I said, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts. How could we translate that lesson from then 
to what we do now. Um, and, and so sometimes the art of the leadership is helping the group sort of shift from, from, from past wounds, past scars. I mean, there's a lot of great people in government and some of them have just had the, 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 the desire and proactivity to, to bring change. Um, you know them, unfortunately, for various reasons. And so in some respects, like you said earlier, it's about help healing that trauma uh, is the art of a good leader. The other thing that I would say not to do, and you see a lot of organizations do this, is they create a new chief fill-in-the-blank officer, whatever it might be. And they, they, they put all their hopes on that single officer, and that's not the case. I mean, it really has to be a whole organizational effect. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is find ways to link what people do um, to what intrinsically motivates them. Uh, one of the questions I love to ask people is what brings them joy? And, and especially in, in the circumstances where I work, whether it's IT, AI, space, or bio, they're like, well, why are you asking this question? I'm like, I'm curious what motivates you. I want to know, the, I want to know what, what gives you excitement at work or outside of work. Because if you can figure out what people are intrinsically motivated by, and I think a lot of us have different intrinsic motivations, uh, when, that, when that challenge comes along where their skill sets and their interests fit that challenge, um, in some respects, they'll lead the way and all you need to do is be that champion and that encourager uh, for them. Absolutely. And, you know, when you mentioned this, the, the whole of organization approach, um, I could not agree more. And I was in my work with the Department of Defense. Uh, the reports are actually available online on their website. It's, uh, called, uh, the project was called Holistic Security Ecosystems. And we really worked with them exactly to show how important it is this whole uh, of government whole organization approach because it's not only the Department of Defense when it comes to something like Katrina or you know, terrorist attack for that matter you have to have all of them organized and, and collaborative and usually they don't know how to work together and so we work very much on that uh, and you know so I just uh, could not agree more that uh, part of the change is also that an important part of the change and, you know, when uh, this is also inspired by your keynote at uh, George Lason, when all the global superpowers on the United Nations Security Council are also nuclear superpowers. And to be honest, yes, we did not develop enough as, as uh, our conversation also underlined a bit. We are chiefs with nukes still. Uh, and uh, they cannot agree on denuclearization, nor on stopping the production of weapons of mass destruction. So maybe it's time to turn our eyes from the AI and rather enforce the adoption of a UN human rights framework in each and every of the member countries. Once this is achieved, we can apply this UN human rights framework also to AI design and development. And that's definitely a world I'd like to live in. I'd like to, to ask you for an inspirational quote. I do not know if in a sequel to what I just said, or what would be an inspirational quote for you? Because we are approaching the the end of right. our podcast. I'd like our listeners to remain with something is uh -huh. even more well, inspirationally possible <laughs> than this sure, conversation. I'll try to I'll try to make it. Uh, so so uh, I think on the fly, I think it's worth recognizing that the words expertise and experience both come from experia. So it's Greek for out of danger. And that the only way you get expertise in some field or some, some, some human understanding or some endeavor is you have to do those dangerous things, those experiments. And experiments don't always work out. Um, you know, there was Project Corona in the 1959, which was to launch a rocket that would take photos of the Soviet Union, parachute a film canister, and then have that film canister be picked up and to help uh, address the Cold War. And the first 13 rockets blew up. Uh, and it wasn't until attempt number 21 they finally succeeded. Uh, later, those images were declassified uh, in the 1990s, and it became it was got bought by Google and became the basis for Google Earth. But I raise that because sometimes when you're trying to gain experience and expertise in a field, you're going to be doing those experiments that won't always work out. But I worry that that we've now created a culture of shame as opposed to okay, you're you're, you're trying, you're in there, you're doing something. And the last thing I will say on that is maybe the other inspirational quote is that fails an acronym; they just didn't tell you. It's first attempt at iterative learning. There will be a second <laughs> attempt, a third attempt, and fourth attempt. Uh, and as long as you're I doing new learning, you're better. 
fail. Okay, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna remember that. I'm taking notes here. That's amazing. Thank you so much. So uh, one more or maybe two more quick questions uh, in the end, uh, David, so uh, that our uh, audience gets to know you more intimately. If uh, you would have the possibility to have lunch with anyone alive or not alive anymore, who would you pick? One. That's a really good question. Uh, If it was just one, it's a toss up between Ben Franklin and George Washington. I'd just be curious what they were thinking when they were both before the revolution, during the revolution, and then all the messiness afterwards as they were trying to write the Constitution. I mean, you read some of the the, the, the takeaways, and it was pretty messy. Um, and so, um, and I guess maybe leaning more towards Ben Franklin, because at least some of his notes say that he recognized that there were things in the Constitution that were imperfect, including the fact that not everybody was being given the right to vote, whether based on gender or race or things like that. And so, you know, he was frustrated. Um, and and so I, I, I guess I would have been similarly, because I, I guess I sometimes get frustrated when I don't see things being as fair or just or as, as equal as they could be now. And so I'd be interested in his thinking um, and, and maybe yes. yeah, we can move to more 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 perfect societies together. I and I, you know, really uh, have a lot to say here. You know, they were total geniuses. Definitely, definitely. I don't know if I would pick them, but definitely I have to underline their genius. I also have to say something regarding that I am a woman, obviously. And but at that time, so we have to look at that through the lenses of the time. I mean, they were so visionaries, and at that time, women were not as educated. And I think it was a thing of responsibility for them to have people who are more educated involved in the decision making, speaking of experience and all that, uh, what you underlined there. And uh, so, yeah, good choice is all I have to say. Here. I will give a shout out to Abigail Adams. She was, you know, you look at her relative with John. John Adams was smart, but Abigail Adams was super smart, I would say. Totally, <laughs> totally. I agree. And I also want to say something here that uh, we need the same kind of genius now when we are writing the Artificial General Intelligence Constitution. And we are working on that, inspired by their work, by the work of those with who you want to have lunch. So um, I'm going to uh, drag you into that work as well because Happy it's to. I mean, so that, important. That is, a, that is a fun challenge as to how we make sure it's more a more perfect union of both humans and machines together. Exactly. And uh, yeah, so we're going to have lunch over that, uh, David. Yeah, you are my favorite on that, my choice. <laughs> so, and, and to end... Um, you know, so you were doing, you've done so many things, obviously, since yes, probably you were born, but I started with when you were 15. Um, what is the meaning of life? What drives you in doing all of those things? What, what's the meaning of life for you? Yeah, so aside from the answer of 42, which I'm sure everyone gives. <laughs> of course, no, and no, Simon no. Wolfram mentioned that. And he said, yes, probably his simulations will end up at 42 at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, um, you know, as, as a father... I would say the meaning of life, I guess, is to leave leave the world in a better state than when you found it, if you can. Um, and even if you can't, you know, the, the world may feel like there's a lot of turbulence. And, and I think it's all, I mean, if you look throughout history, it, there, there's always been turbulence. But I guess if I was to look back at my life, if I'm fortunate enough to be 80 in the future, look back at my life. I want to say that I've done the best I could to try and mitigate the bad things from happening to to as many people as possible, and to uplift as many as much as many people as possible along the way, um, so that the world, you know, wherever possible, uh, was better both for individuals and for communities um, through collective action. And your work and life are clear testimony that this is the meaning of your life, and I think it's such an inspiration for so many of us. Uh, so I want to thank you so much for being our guest. I look forward to you and I hope you can honor our invitation for the beneficial general intelligence. I will be in touch regarding the collaborations which you underline now. A few threads there. I'm sure there will be many more. I really want to thank you again for being with us. Well, thank you for a heartfelt conversation and I love the sunrise behind you. It's sort of it's sort of a, a closing image for, for what we're working on together. Thank and you. it is the Blue Ridge Mountains here in Virginia, in our backyard, uh, <laughs> so David, <laughs> where I'm spending my weekends as much as I can. <laughs> Inspir- Nature is getting, important. Getting inspiration for, for the work, yes. Excellent. Well, thank you again. It's been really an honor. Truly appreciate it.
Thank you.